Hmm. I have no idea what Sam Bakula is. I'd have to look at it. You're not just losing your memory. Memory. I don't know what that is either. Okay. Um. I was asked, am I taking interns again? Uh, that is an extremely difficult question. Um, short answer is I'm trying my best not to take on new interns. Um, do I have a couple of interns who've now worked their way back into my life? Yes. <laughs> I can't lie and say, um, uh, so Aaron is back. Well, Aaron is here. Tyler is back. Um, Tino is back. Um, you know, they, they're, they're all hanging out. Um, um, I, look, look, I don't mind working with interns. The, the, the only issue I, I have with the interns, and this is just, I prefer interns who know the way I work. When I'm in class, I know there's kind of a weird distinction, but I'm at work. So because I'm at work, I'm a teacher, so I'm teaching. The interns is really independent self-study. I mean, <laughs> it, if, if any of you knew how much I worked, um, you know, I, I average 60 to 70 hours a week. I mean, that's a typical work week for me. So the amount of time that I can really dedicate to an intern, what it tends to be is guided instruction, like, hey, go work on this. Um, so that person is usually off on their own fighting the good fight a lot. So um, as long as the person has realistic expectations of what we're going to be doing. Um, they're going to be building my labs, debugging stuff for me, helping me with penetration testing reports and stuff like that. You, you know, don't get me wrong. You know, it's not that they don't learn, but it's not a mentor in the sense of where I'm sitting next to you, walking you through stuff like I do in class. And that's the only reason why I'm really reluctant to take on interns because um, only the guys that have done the intern stuff with me before, I feel like really understand that. And also anybody who's worked with me knows like I pile it on, like it's coming. Like you're, you're going to be drinking from the fire hose if you deal with me, you know? <laughs> All right, guys. So let's get back to it, huh? Okie dokie, smokey. Let's crank open them slides. Okay, let's talk architectures. Okay, so now that you guys got the the big picture of how the architecture stuff works, let's see if we can drive down into how this stuff works when people talk about it conceptually, right? So you're going to hear about this world, and that's the alphabet soup, right? Client, server, multi-tier, MVC, MVP, MVVP, SOA. You're going to hear about a lot of this kind of stuff, and it's it's frustrating. I I really wish there was an easy way to learn it, but as long as you keep in mind using the errors to figure out what you're dealing with, you're going to be better suited. You're going to be better prepared, excuse me, to deal with this stuff. Okay, so. When you hear people talk about the reference architecture, the content backbone, the business logic area uh, tier, and the presentation tier, I want you to go back to that diagram that we had showed you earlier. I don't know where it is now, but.
So no matter how complicated it gets, keep this in mind. No matter how much they talk about that it's so much more complicated, you always go back to this three-tiered architecture, and at least that's how I do it. I try not to get sucked into everything. Stay with this, okay? Okay, so here in this case, you see them showing a reference architecture. The reference architecture is what they're considering infrastructure. So if you look at the bottom, when you hear people talk about that reference architecture, that's what you see being considered infrastructure. If you look at the pictures on the bottom left side, you can see monitors and you can see how it says corporate network intranet. That's the that reference architecture is the infrastructure. Then after that, you're going to see where it says content backbone and persistence. And then that content backbone and persistence, that's the tiers of database, the I mean, tiers of servers that manage everything. Up above that, you're going to see it says use cases, business logic. So right now on this from the bottom up, we're at level three. You see it's got Java. It's got Eclipse, right? This is their application server architecture. And then up top, you see where it says client portal or presentation layer. Again, this is just ways so that you need to think of this stuff like the OSI model. Like it's not a literal thing, but it's a reference so that we can know what we're talking about, right? That's really what it is, right? It helps us, it helps us communicate, okay? All right, so it, it's a way to give you a visual representation of how things are going to be structured and how stuff is going to talk to stuff. You need to remember it's not literal. It is not. I repeat, it is not literal. It is a reference. It is conceptual. It allows us to communicate. It is not literal. If you consider it literal, you'll find yourself really confused when you start running into multiple components being on the same physical server, right? Which there's way more of than you think, right? Okay, so when you see this app stuff, you have to be conscious of the fact that oftentimes a lot of this stuff is happening on a single server. <laughs> okay, so you're always going to see me say that. Let's slow down. Client server architecture. This is what the bulk of the world is the most familiar with. Your client on the at your laptop, right, talking to a server. Now, you need to realize that a server is not a server. A server is a is a computer running an application, the application can be communicated with over a logical port. So a web server is a box running an exe file. The exe file can be accessed through port 80. The exe file can be accessed through port 80. You can interact with it over a logical port. This is what allows you to change the port that the app runs on. You can change the port that the app runs on. You don't have to run your web server on port 80. The reason you don't have to run your web server on port 80 is because it's just an application. Your web server is no different than Microsoft Word. It's just an app. Your mail server is no different than Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, or Outlook. It's just an app. The only difference is these are apps that can be accessed through a logical port. So because it's an app that can be accessed through a logical port instead of traditional keyboard input, they call it a server, but it's still an EXE. That's all it is. 
So you don't want to get beat up in the, it's a web server, it's a mail server, it's a DNS server. It's just a box running an app. That's it. Now, clients usually have to have some sort of client software to talk to the app. So now remove yourself from the network. We're not talking network. Now you're going to hear people talk about in-tier or multi-tier applications. In-tier, right, in for number, or multi-tier applications. What they're talking about is a reference for how it's supposed to talk. So when you see this in your mind, go back to this. Go back to your presentation layer, your app layer, your database layer. Go back to that, okay? All this is is breaking those layers down so that they're more granular, so that they're more granular. So when you look here, right, you got the client. It goes down. It communicates via HTTP. The presentation layer. The presentation layer, which as you were introduced to it today, the presentation layer is what we're calling the web server, right? Presentation layer is what we're calling the web server. If you look at that, you're going to see that in that presentation layer, this is where you're going to see HTML, CSS, JSP, Servlets, JavaScript, Java server faces, Ajax, etc. Okay, now I want you to relax because the typical person would say, Hey, Joe, if I got ASP, JSP, PHP, C sharp, if I got all that language stuff, then what I'm actually in is the app layer. And you are correct, kind of. The reason is because on the app layer, when I'm producing the app, the app has a front end that the user interacts with. And that front end, although it is still source code in the application, is often considered the presentation layer. So you can write in ASP.NET and the app logic that the app is doing where it's number crunching or doing whatever the app is supposed to do, printing reports or, you know, analytics, whatever the app does, that's in the business logic layer because that's the logic of the app. And then you've got the display layer or the presentation layer, how it displays itself to the user. So even though they're both ASP.NET, presentation layer and app layer, there's usually a distinction between what the user sees and interacts with versus what the user is, what the app is doing is considered, is considered business logic, right? So when you're looking at this diagram, that's what the diagram is trying to depict, right? The presentation layer, the HTML, the JavaScript, because remember, when you write in these languages, C Sharp, Java, and all this kind of stuff, your framework produces HTML and JavaScript and all that. You didn't write it, but when you grab and drag a button on the screen and right-click and say, this is what I want the button to do, and your app populates that functionality, it populates it with JavaScript or whatever the end in display language is, okay? So we need to remember that there's going to be a delineation in the code side between code that does business logic and code that does presentation stuff. Even though it's one developer writing it, for the sake of explaining it to people, right, it technically presentation layer is what the customer interacts with, the app layer, logic layer, is what the app is churning on, the data it's crunching, okay? So this is why down here you see this method call, right? 
So business client facade, this is where Java is interacting with those methods. Remember how I taught you guys object method instance? So now you're literally in, if you get down in here and you look, and you start looking at this stuff, now you're literally inside of that object talking to these function calls, right? Talking to these methods saying, hey, do this. Hey, do that, right? So you're now in the app tier business logic doing stuff, right? And that's what all that stuff is happening. If you get errors here, they're going to be doku errors, runtime errors. They're going to be type mismatch errors. They're going to be all that stuff. You are now in the app tier, okay? Now, when you get down here, when that app tier stuff needs to communicate with the data store, this is when you're going to start seeing ODBC, JDBC errors because the app tier is now trying to communicate with that database tier. And this is where you're going to start seeing stuff. So you can figure out where you're at based on the errors. Okay. Okay. So you're going to see that client server model, traditional client server model, single application, a single machine, single application that provides services to multiple clients. It could be one web server. It could be um, uh, one WCF-based service. Um, it could be... Um, um, Oh man, now you made me forget what uh, WCF stands for. It's like Windows something foundation. I don't remember. Um, and then the clients, they, they have a way that they can interact with this app, right? So they have some mechanism that they use to interact with this. Okay. Okay, so this is your typical client server model, right? Server communicates over network connection with client. Typical client servers that we are familiar with, right? Your web server, right? FTP, uh, uh, you know, email. So as you look at these, we're, we're used to this web server. The web browser is the client. FTP server, your FTP client software is the client. SQL server, your SQL, you know, man, uh, connection client software is how you talk to it. So for each of these, you've got this, you know, client server set of apps that talk to each other. Okay, in tier applications, this is what you're finally being introduced to today, right? So you're being introduced to that presentation layer, uh, app layer, resource layer. You know, you're, you're, you're being introduced to that. So your front end, right, he provides the user interface to the system, right? So the presentation layer or the web server layer is what provides that. <clears throat> your middle tier is the server software that provides the app logic, you know, what does it do? Whatever the real app does, that's what's going on here. And then the back end, the database layer, is the data store where the data is contained. It doesn't matter if it's LDAP, it doesn't matter if it's SQL, it doesn't matter if it's XML, you know, the back end is where the data is, you know, you know, actually resides. Okay. So if you kind of look at it now, right, you can see how you've got your client tier, your business tier, and then you've got your back end tier. Okay. So this is that transition from that, you know, multi-tiered 
where you're going from presentation to business logic to data access, right? This is how it how it goes through. And you're going to start hearing these different acronyms like HTML5 and Silverlight and all these different things that happen at these different layers. Okay. okay, this is my favorite diagram. Okay, I absolutely love how they've drawn this, not my diagram, of course, but I love how they've drawn this break or water line between the client and server. So if you can look up top, you can see how you got that presentation GUI right on the left side. And you can see it's got the end user systems. They're going to use, you know, HTML or Windows Forms or some sort of client software to interact with it, right? And then what's above that blue waterline is that distributed logic, right? So this is the proxy layers. Uh, and then you see that client-based interface. All of that stuff is above that waterline. It's all presentation layer. Now, when you get below this waterline where it says the web server, hmm, VB script, J script, web form, C sharp, VB.net, right? And it produces HTML, XML, DHTML, WML, et cetera, right? This is what's produced there. And now what blows you away is you can see how you've got that proxy tier which gives you things like SOAP, COBRA, RMI, DCOM, XML, RPC, right? This is how that tier communicates. And then it breaks down into the business tier, the access tier, and the database tier, right? So this is, this is actually my favorite because it was the first time I ever actually saw somebody like really get granular and start breaking down how does all this stuff actually talk? You know, how does the stuff talk? So I want you guys to work your magic. Get crazy Google Foo. Crazy Google Foo. Okay. Can anybody tell me? What is CSS? What is CSS? Cascaded style sheets. Way to go, guys. Exactly, John. Logical versus physical. Good. Cascading style sheets. Right? It's the way that we make that presentation layer look pretty, right? There you go, Jim. That's right. It's used to format web pages, make sure that stuff looks the way it looks. And what layer is that going to be on? Good. Very good. Okay. Ruby on Rails. What is Ruby on Rails? What is it? There you go. Definitely a programming language. Right? It's a programming language. It's a framework that you can use. Right? Right? Object-oriented MVC-based language. Right? You can do the real magic with it. Now, uh, here's where we want to get, get a little picky. Can you... Please forgive me, guys. I'm eating. Can you... With Ruby on Rails, can you, with Ruby on Rails, produce presentation layer code? Can you produce presentation level code? Yes, you can, huh? 
So you can write in Ruby on Rails, and some of the output will be HTML and JavaScript, huh? Right, because you still have to provide the user interface. Good. Okay. What's Django? You can fill me in. What's Django? Mm hmm. Very good job, guys. Now, can Django produce presentation layer code? Good. Very good. What about C Sharp? C Sharp? Yeah, what's C sharp? What's C sharp, guys? What's C sharp? Looks like a C and a hashtag or a pound sign. What's C sharp? It's a Microsoft programming language. You could argue it's not proprietary anymore. Hmm. Audio's breaking up a bit. Okay, how about now? Can you guys hear me okay now? A little bit better? Okay. Oh, my God, if I sing you a song, you guys will all leave. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to push through a little bit more. C-sharp. C 
C-sharp is, um, you know, pretty popular Microsoft derivative language, right? It's, you know, it's a little, you know, instead of Visual C++ and all that, like the good old days in Visual Basic, C-sharp gives you real strong object-oriented, heavily, heavily fully featured language. Um, if you use PowerShell, you're using C-sharp. I mean, it's got the same class structure. And it takes the pulls from the super classes of C-sharp. So, you know, PowerShell is basically a baby C-sharp. Um, and, and it's an MVC-based framework, right? So it's, it's what you're going to use for your business logic code and your presentation code. Okay. So now you're going to hear the term in our world, MVC. You're going to hear that a lot. So Okay, so David's question is so JavaScript is is it presentation layer? That's usually where it runs. Let's say that. Okay? And is JavaScript a framework? JavaScript isn't really a framework yet. Now, what you do have that I'm going to cover later is something called SPA, single page applications, right? So that's going to be things like Node.js, Ember.js, AngularJS. It's going to be those types of apps. And what it is is it's server-side JavaScript code. It's still in the presentation layer, but what they're doing is they're making stuff, they're making stuff be more optimized for mobile. They're making stuff be more optimized for extremely fast performance on the web. So instead of a lot of back end heavy lifting in the back end, you're pushing as much of that stuff to the presentation layer as possible and offloading some of that work to the client. All right, but we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> Car screeching. <laughs> All right, let's get hardcore. All right. What's up with MVC? MVC has this way that it interacts, right? So you have this multi-view controller. So your data is separated from the code that's working on your data, right? And quite frankly, anytime that there's a security issue, you intermingle code with data. It's what causes buffer overflows. It's what causes SQL injection. It's what causes cross-site scripting. 90% of security issues somehow, somehow come from you intermingling code with data. Data is thinking, excuse me, code is trying to work on something that it's thinking is data and you, you know, stuck code in there. Data is trying to be processed and you stuck, you know, code in that place, right? I mean, that's really how buffer overflows happen. That's how SQL injection happens. It's how process scripting happens. So the whole concept behind a multi-view controller is to actually logically separate the two, right? Controller, he manages how data moves. So you've got this, you know, database, you've got this web service, you've got wherever your data is at. And the controller manages the requests that go to and from that data, the, from that model, right? So that's what the controller is in the middle on the left-hand side. And then the view, the display portion, is what's sent to the user. So the user can have something that looks the way he wants to look and the data is pushed 
from the view to the user, right? We call that MVC. So this is what allows you as a person to write code and then inside of the code that you write, you know, whether it be Django, it would be on Rails, C Sharp, G2W, it doesn't matter what it is, you write code and that code gets logically broken up as, hey, here's my display layer code, here's my business logic layer code. And the data that has to move through it is also kind of separated and encapsulated. So it just becomes a way to try your best not to intermingle code and data. Now, the entire concept behind this is to make it as transparent, let me rephrase that, as abstract to the developer as possible. The developer does not know what he's talking to, does not care. He knows he's talking to the model and the view displays it, period. He really doesn't care if the model is a database. He doesn't care if it's an XML file. He doesn't care if it's a web service. He does not care. He just talked to the model, right? The model is where the data is, to, is stored. As far as the reference of how it comes back and gets displayed, the view handles that. And then the controller manages the request. So if you look at what's going on in MVC, MVCs are what have, for lack of a better word, fixed a lot of issues that developers had because developers weren't logically separating the code that they wrote. Now that you write in an MVC, a lot of that heavy lifting is done for you. So this is why those of us who are security testers, you often hear that we don't really care for it like we used to in the good old days because you're just not going to find the SQL injections and the cross-site scriptings and all of that like you did in the apps of the past. Now that MVCs are dominating the development world, there's just not as much of that stuff as there was before. So SQL injection and all that kind of stuff is going away. These are gone. No, no. But now, because it's so difficult to intermingle code with data, real functionality of the app, app misuse, it's more of what are called logic bugs. Being able to make the app do stuff it's not designed to do, as opposed to code execution bugs, you know, getting the app to execute arbitrary code, you know, that's really what's going on. So if you jump into the software development and software security world, you're going to see that it's it's really moving away from the injection flaws and all the stuff of yesteryear. Okay, so here's some examples of uh, MVC-based frameworks, right? Your ASP.NET, your, you know, your, your Java server pages like JSF and Struts and Spring and, you know, PHP is going to give you stuff like Cake PHP and Code Igniter and, you know, Zend and all those different things. And Python is going to give you Django and Zoop, you know, stuff that I like. I like Django. Ruby on Rails is another MVC based framework. Okay. So now, are you ready to blow your mind? MVC frameworks do not replace multi-tier architecture. They work together. Crazy, huh? You spend all that time learning how client-server in-tier stuff works. Now you're going to turn around and say, in an MVC, this is how it works? Well, hold on. Why would you just teach me in-tier? Because the in-tier is how the stuff is structured architecturally, now how does the app itself manage data? That's MVC, right? So in tiers, architecture, MVC is data management. Okay. All right. MVP. 
as opposed to NBC, multi-view presenter is just more focused on the presentation layer. That's all. So it's still the same thing, but there's way more focus dedicated to the presentation layer and interacting with the user, right? So it's similar to NBC. It's just the focus is more on the user interface and design and how it talks to the user, how it communicates with the user. It's more focused on that, right? And then there's presentation access, access control, excuse me, abstraction control. Nowhere near as popular as the other two, but definitely still on the horizon, right? But at the end of the day, you're going to keep noticing with all the, all the derivative frameworks, how much more focused they are on UX, user, inter, user experience. Okay. Okay, now when you run into things like multi-view view model, all it is is basically a hybrid, right? It just gives you a little bit more of that controller view and the, um, you know, more focus on the front-end development as well, right? So this is what slams together, you know, things like Silverlight, you know, it's what gives you that. Okay, so MVVM, right, this is what's going to give you these really complex Microsoft apps. Now, when you get into the Microsoft world, you're going to find that anytime Microsoft has anything they want to do, rather than adding it in one language, they tend to want to build something new. You know, this is why you got things like Silverlight. You know, they really like to build stuff. So what you end up doing is you, Microsoft takes the approach of each component is kind of a specialized component. So let's take the focus, let's build it, let's build it well so that it does its intended task. So let's take the focus, let's build it, let's build it well so that it does its intended task. Okay. Trying to look here, calls to the presenter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay, I remember this. Yeah, no real significant difference between MVP and MVVP as opposed to. Um, data being more bi-directional, it's the only real, real thing. All right. Now let's finish with this. SOA, Service Oriented Architecture. So what's going on here, guys, is you've got this concept of how do I talk to this data store? And the idea is to have something that you, that's just you know, I send my message, he goes off and he does his magic. When he comes back, I deal with the response. And that's the whole thing behind SOA, right? So service-oriented architecture is autonomous, it's stateless, it accepts requests, or gives back responses, and it's pretty well-defined, usually a, a XML, right? So each service operates autonomously without any awareness of the other services. Right, it's got no memory, it doesn't keep state, but I tell you what, that sucker scales, it scales, it scales, it scales, it scales. So client asks a server, server returns an answer, and it's usually pretty tight casted how that's gonna look, right? So you've got a couple of communication mechanisms, a couple of protocols that we use. It could be XML. It could be SOAP, it could be JSON, it could be RSS, it could be Atom, it could be HTTP, it could be FTP, it could be SMP, it can be RPC, right? It's not operating system dependent, right? And almost every programming language can do it. So this is the now of web app development. It's not the future. This is where we're at now. 
So what I'd like to have you do is I'd like you to crack open Google. So I crack open Google, and I want you to search for Amazon.com WSDL. Amazon.com WSDL. And you should come up with a WSDL form for Amazon. WSDL stands for Web Services. Description language, web services, description language. So when you open up the file, when you open up the file, you should get some XML. Now, when you're looking at this XML file, what you need to realize is, let's say I'm out here and I'm on Amazon.com. Now, I'm on Amazon.com, and I decide that I want to buy the DaVinci Code. So I'm like, you know what? I really want to buy the DaVinci Code because Dan Brown obviously needs more money, right? So I go DaVinci Code. So now I say, all right, well, let's go look at the DaVinci Code, and I notice how much their book costs. But I also notice that they have way, way, way more copies of the book in various conditions, new, used, all of that. Come on, computer. There we go. Okay, so now as you're looking at this, you can see here's the DaVinci code, but look at these. They got it used, they got it new, they got collectibles. So when I click on this, you're going to see that I've got all these various prices starting at $3. But you'll see that each of these, even though it's hundreds of vendors, I mean, even though it's hundreds of entities, they're not all Amazon. They're all completely different vendors all over the world. Now, the beauty that you get from that. You see that, guys? So I can be like, hey, this is coming from, see, I don't want this, right? This is coming from the United Kingdom, and it, I won't be here till 11, uh, 11 to 22nd of January, right? So even though it's $3, I don't want that one. Okay, so these guys, they give me uh, free shipping. Right? That's awesome, right? But as you go through this, you can see, you can read the ratings, you can see how many orders they've done, where they're geographically located, how much inventory they have. So now what you got to ask yourself is, how does Amazon track inventory, track shipping across all these different vendors for the exact same product? They do it with this WSDL, Web Services Description Language. It's XML, and this describes how we talk, what we call everything. They like to use terminology similar to a warehouse. So they like to put everything in bins, right? So each bin has a bin name, a bin item count, a bin parameter. Right, and you have a mechanism for how you search through 
the pin. Now they need to identify who you are, right? So you get a marketplace domain, you get an AWS access key, you get an associate tag. They set up the staping, we're gonna cover that later. They have a method of validating who you are, and they need to know is this request shared or is it not? And they go on and they do that all throughout the document. Look at there. Audience reader, author, brand, composer, conductor, director, keywords, manufacturer, max price, um, minimum percentage points off, whole thing. So you can share your entire inventory. Amazon, after you ship something, can decrement and update your inventory. Everything is all real time. So this is just really, really handy because as long as we all speak XML, it doesn't matter if you're Windows. It doesn't matter if you're Linux. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, FreeBSD, Unix. does not matter. As long as we all speak XML, that's what this is doing. So the web service gives you a way to talk to something, although not necessarily a database. It's still a data store. It's a big container for data. It doesn't fit the same structure of the data as a database would have, but there's no standardized way to do it. So you can write it however you want via JSON, via XML, all these different things. But this is a web service description language file. Okay, I think we covered enough. I hope that we got deep enough that when we do the burp suite stuff, when we come back from lunch, you can follow it pretty well, okay? All right, guys, I think we ought to take lunch. <laughs>